Hey guys, James here from ebassguitar.com and if you're interested in learning a little bit about how to play jazz standards on the bass guitar or looking at the construction of how these great tunes are made up, please do check out this video all the way to the end. So hey guys, James here from e -Bass Guitar, and welcome to this lesson. Today we're going to be talking all about jazz standards. Uh, this lesson came from uh, a question in my Facebook group by a guy called Bob Henderson. So hello Bob, thanks for the question. Um, and I put a question out there saying, what do you guys want to learn? And he said, jazz standards. And obviously I probably need a whole YouTube channel to do that film. Um, but I'm going to give you an overview of what jazz standards actually are and how they're constructed today in today's lesson. So, um, because often what guys have, tr have, have difficulty with is uh, they listen to jazz and they just can't understand the structure behind it. So I'm gonna pin this down and show you some of the key components in there. So what are jazz standards exactly? Um, jazz standards are a set of tunes that jazz musicians uh, use to um, create jazz music essentially. It's a framework and these are songs and these songs often came from musical songs in the 1930s, 40s and 50s. They don't have to, that's not exclude. As with anything in music, they're always um, exceptions, but this was a great source of inspiration for these tunes. And so think of Gershwin and Cole Porter. So songs like um, My Funny Valentine, Summertime, uh, My Favourite Things, all those sort of 50s Disney musics, uh, Disney musicals, those kind of things. These provided great frameworks for jazz musicians to go away and put their own spin on things. Um, and the great thing about jazz standards is they use these particular chord sequences as a framework and then they'll put their own spin on it. So no two musicians or two bands or groups of musicians will ever sound the same. Um, so if you take a take a pop song, for instance, a great classic rock song, I'm just picking something off of my head, like Summer of 69, by and large, every cover band across the world, and I say this with a pinch of salt, for instance, sounds pretty, very similar within a tolerance level, depending how good they are, a few percent. But one, somebody playing My Favourite Things, one set of jazz musicians to another, it could be wildly different. So that's one of the major, major things that's different about it. The other thing is the construction of jazz standards. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how these work. I'm gonna use a tune today called Take the A Train. It's by the great um, jazz composer, Duke Ellington. Uh, I'm gonna play a bit later on so you can actually hear how this sounds. Um, and we're gonna talk through the construction of it because it's a little bit different to a pop song. With a pop song, um, it's likely well, the standard, I'm going to give you a typical pop song construction. This is kind of classic, your classic 3 minute 33 construction. So you will have a verse, a pre-chorus, a chorus, a verse, a pre-chorus, and a chorus, maybe a bridge section, and then a double chorus on the end. And these little small components will make up the bigger song. So a verse might be 8 bars long, it might be 16 bars, somewhere typically in those lengths, okay? And we'll sort of construct it from these various chunks. and. The, um, I guess the format I just gave you is, is a very typical cliche uh, song construction. But with jazz standards, what we deal with is a slightly longer construction. Um, by and large, these, not always, but the most typical form, and I'm making huge sort of gener generalities, is that a word even? Um, and uh, uh, about this is a 32 bar form. And I've mapped this 32 bar form out here. And I'm gonna talk you through this 32 bar form so you can see the difference. But what musicians will do, jazz musicians, is this form will pretty much exclusively make up the whole song. So they could be playing for two minutes on this form or they could be playing for 20 minutes on, the, on this particular form. But this particular form, regardless of what they all, always do, it's the framework behind the music. And getting to know and understand this form and begin to hear it is one of the most crucial steps that you can make um, into actually understanding the jazz framework. So I'm gonna talk you through this. I'm gonna dissect these 32 bars here because there's a real set format to this. And I'm gonna, this is the most common uh, format to this. And the, we, we can call these sections just A and B, okay? So we have what we've got called here is an AAB format, okay? So the first, we split this into eight bar sections and you'll see C, 
D7 flat five, D minus seven, G7 C. That's our first A. So I'm gonna put A here on the margin. And you can see we can symbolize the end of that section with a double bar there. The second A section starts immediately afterwards. Okay, and then we go through, and if you look, that's pretty much identical. Sometimes they will change to the last chord here um, to take us into the next section, but essentially, again, by and large the same. So we're gonna put, circle the double bars to um, show the difference in the sections there. And then the next section is, this is where we hit the B section. So I'm gonna put B in there, like that. And we could go to the F, we have four bars of F, then we go down to a D7, a D minus seven, and a G7. And that's the end of the section. Then, believe it or not, we're back to the A section. You'll see the similarity here, okay, between that and the first A. And that is the construction. And we end up with this really classic A, A, B, A construction. And this is I don't wish to speculate how, what the percentage of jazz tunes which use this construction are, but it, it is absolutely vast and you'll find it all over the place. So let's talk a little bit um, about some of the component things that go into jazz standards. Um, from a bass player's perspective, if we're playing swing music, let's deal with this. The most important thing that we're going to be doing as bass players is playing walking bass throughout the whole thing. But you will hear another couple of devices going along all the way through this. Jazz musicians will tend to play what's called the head, okay, or the tune. Head, it, they, you'll sometimes see them pointing at their heads to say it's time to play the tune again. And this is the well-known piece bit which ties it all together. So this is where you'll have, in this case, the Take the A Train Melody, which I'll play you in a little while, okay. Or you might have my favourite things, my funny Valentine, all those sort of classic tunes you might hear over the top. And the musicians may embellish them a little bit, but fundamentally, you'll hear that in there. Okay? Uh, then they will go off and improvise. This is just a core constituent part of jazz music is this improvisation and the musicians are putting their own spin on it they are playing their own lines over the top and every musician will improvise differently and that's what makes them all sound different so we will go into a largely improvised section on there and then again it's fairly typical to have the head again at the end just to sum things up to bring it up there may be some other little devices within there that you'll hear them using because everybody's trying to push this music forward. But typically you'll have a head, you'll have some solos and you'll have the head again or the tune, okay? So let's get into actually playing some of this for you. Um, what I've got here is I have a backing track for Take the A Train. Uh, this is a backing track made by a great jazz educator called Jamie Abersole. You can buy these um, on, uh, I guess iTunes, I think I've seen them on there. They may even be on Spotify and places like that. Uh, they're quite they're very widely available for a couple of dollars, something like that. They're not expensive. Um, and he's made hundreds upon hundreds of these over the years, back in, I don't know, the 80s and 90s. Uh, um, but they are great. They give us great backing tracks to actually practice playing our walking bass to because the bass is on one side of the mix on the left and piano on the other. So you can turn off the bass if you want. Um, and they give us something to work to and they give us the real feel of a band. So they're, they're a great, great little device. They're a great little tool to practice to. I'm not affiliated to Jamie Abersell in any way, but they're, they're, they're a good way of practicing. So go and, do, uh, go and check those out. Um, and so I've got a Jamie Abersell track here. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna play you the tune, okay? It's not totally typical that the bass player should play the tune, um, but I want you to hear the tune um, so you know what it sounds like. Um, and I'm gonna play you some walking bass, and I'm also gonna play you a very simple solo over this. And good solos should outline the chord changes. And that's what, um, I'm not gonna fly around here, I'm gonna play pretty simple, and so you can hear the chord, so you can hear the chord changes in there, because a good soloist, you'll be able to hear the chords. Everything will relate back to this 32 bar framework. Uh, so that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna do coming up now. Okay? One, two, one, two, three, four. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
So guys, you can clearly hear the different sections in there. You can hear the uh, you can hear me play the head, okay, the tune in there. Um, you heard me play a chorus, okay. Chorus is uh, 32 bars worth of uh, walking, and then you heard me uh, play a solo. As I said, I try to keep that very based on the chord changes, so you can really hear the harmony within that. Um, what I suggest you do, I don't want to give you any specific listening of particular artists. You should go and check out obviously there are loads which I could do but what I want you to do is go away and start your journey by putting into Spotify even YouTube but take the A train in and listen find five to ten different versions of this I mean maybe try and find one written in the 1920s and then one recorded last year or something like that um, and listen to the different interpretations and try and hear these different parts in there um, and the different sections and the heads and the solos, all that kind of thing, all that stuff in there. And then you'll really start to learn and understand the form of this music. Um, if you want to grab the music for this, there's a, a link below this post where you can click to download the music, which is all there. So you can print this off and uh, play along with this yourself. Hop over to iTunes or whatever and find uh, find a play along for this. So you can actually hear how this goes along or some of the apps out there uh, like iReal Pro where you can actually find more electronic versions of this um, I mean, electronically generated, not electronic music um, versions uh, of this to play along with. Um, if you've enjoyed this lesson, uh, please do comment below. I'd love to know what you've found most valuable, what the most important thing that you've learned from this lesson is. If you've enjoyed it, please do give it uh, a like and a share on social. That'd be absolutely great. Once again, I've been James from uh, ebassguitar.com and I will see you next time. Cheers for now. Bye-bye.